One, two, three, four. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Laying on the Table, the Southern Board Game Podcast with the accent on Southern. As usual, I am your host, Joe Mahaffey, and with me, as always, is my good friend and partner in crime... James Englehart over here cheering you, Joe, for getting the, the intro once again correct. Again, That's keeping the copy right over here in the line of sight really helps me do that. Awesome. Reading, reading awesome. is a wonderful thing, right? They used to tell us it was fundamental. It is. It, it is. Really is. Yeah, yes. Reading is fundamental, yeah. So this particular episode of Lay It on the Table is supported by Mythicon, the uh, Carolina-based game con that is going to be in Charlotte on November 10th through the 12th uh, at the Hilton at University. So if you're interested in knowing more about that, please head over to their website, which is not in front of my line of sight, which is just telling you why that is so important, gameforallevents.com. And you can go ahead and see what the schedule is going to be like and go ahead and register for that event. And of course, James and I are planning on being there and we look forward to seeing you in person. But today, we are excited to have a guest. Um, Linda Codega is with us today, and you may all know her as the journalist uh, from io9 and Gizmodo that dropped the OGL on Hasbro and put the Pinkertons right there in front of the wizards and just really is uh, slaying a dragon by the way you disrupt these crazy things that these companies think that they can get away with. However, she is also a writer, game designer, investigative journalist, and a fellow Southerner. And so James and I are happy to welcome Linda Cadega to lay it on the table. Welcome, Linda. Hey. Uh, just a quick note. My pronouns are they and them. Thank you. Thank you. I will get that wrong because I'm over 50 and I struggle with that, so I do apologize, and I will get it right from now on. Perfect. Thank you. But yeah, I'm a, I'm excited to be here. All of those things are correct. Um, I grew up in Virginia and Tennessee and like the southern the southern part of Virginia. Um, and my parents currently live in North Carolina. Ah. Oh, that is so awesome. Yep. So which, I, which I part of North there. Carolina are they in? Where you expect old white middle class people to be. They're in the Outer Banks. Oh, okay. Because oh. it's either there or in the mountains. See, yeah. I was, I was going to say Wilmington when you said that. So, you know, uh, it just close, kinda, close, close. Be, yeah, they actually, uh, they live on Roanoke. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Awesome. Yeah, they love it. Um, they've been there a while and they're just, they're definitely like island, like that sort of like small island people. So, so I live in nice. Charlotte. I live in Charlotte. And anytime I try to go to the Outer Banks, I feel like that's the longest drive I've ever made in my life and oh, never Lord, left yeah. the state of North Carolina. It is yeah. it is horrendous from Charlotte to get there. I'm not anyway. surprised. Well, there's no straight shot to there. No. So, um, you know, when James and I started this podcast a long time ago, uh, it seems like a long time ago. It was a year ago, I guess it was. We started with an origin story, and we would love to know your origin story, Linda. How did you find your way into all the things that you're passionate about from games to writing, et cetera. Yeah. So I've always been obsessed with books and stories. My father uh, read to me as a kid, which is sort of like, everyone's got that story. Uh, however, my father was like, Edgar Allan Poe is appropriate for a three-year-old. <laughs> and so, you know, by the time that I was four, I could like recite the Raven from memory at like family dinners, uh, which was Totally normal and not morbid <laughs> at all. Um, Little Annabelle Lee to get your kick your knife night off right. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. My dad was just like, "Yeah, you really like caught on to poetry really fast," and I'm just like, "Dad." <laughs> um, he, Love that. He also, he's also like a huge nerd. Um, so is my mother. My mother's like less of a nerd. She like supports. She's like a nerd support system. You know, nice. she's like she's like. Sounds cool, guys. Like, whatever. But she also, like, loves Star Wars. My dad loves Star Wars. My dad also loves Lord of the Rings. There you go. Um, so, again, when I was, like, three, he was like, why don't we just, like, use Lord of the Rings as a bedtime story? That way I can enjoy the stories, too. And I'm just like, this is why I'm the way that I am. You know that, right? Like, you did this to me. That's awesome. And he's just like, whoops. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that's sort of... Uh, 
the basis of a lot of it. And I think that like the point where I knew that I was going to be like a nerd for the rest of my life was when I was nine or 10, it was 2000 and crouching tiger hidden dragon came out. Oh yeah. Yep. And my dad again was just like, this seems like an appropriate <laughs> movie to take a nine year old to read fast kiddo. Yeah. Read fast. That's, so that's awesome. we went to go see it. And I loved it. And so oh, we yeah. get to go see it a second time. And my Sweet. dad, is, my dad's just like, you turned out. Okay. Yeah. I'm just like, <laughs> you're right. But like, come on dad. Um, and then, you know, within like six months after Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon came out, The Fellowship of the Ring came out. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that was just like, ooh, fantasy, sci-fi, nerd shit. I love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was sort of like the the one-two punch for me when I was like 10, where I was just like, oh, this is it. Um, and I sort of, I got started in gaming with role-playing forums online. Mm-hmm. So sort of that like text-based kind of lawless interactions with people. I mean, because there's like not really a lot of rules. There's sort of like, there's some like guidelines for conduct, but there's not really like hard and fast rules. And you can sort of do whatever you want, really. Uh, You just sort of have to ask permission in like interesting ways. So it's like there were built-in safety tools like before that was like a thing in role-playing games. Um, like uh, more traditional like dice pen paper role-playing games so that's really where I got started with like role-playing games and gaming um and yeah just just went from there really and with regards to like writing and being a journalist kind of just fell into it I sort of always knew that I wanted to be a writer when I grew up and I wanted to write for my career because I'm like this is my skill set I'm real (laughs) good at it so I just sort of like circled around journalism for a long time I was like at a local magazine I was at like a small publishing press um I went into marketing to pay the bills for a couple years you know Mm -hmm. um yeah and you know what got back into digital journalism and now I'm here you know right and and it's interesting too because you know you, you talked about at the beginning that you you had both Virginia and Tennessee in your background uh, in that story, where did you start? Which state did you start in and where did you go to? I promise this is not all going to be about Southern geography. No worries. Yeah. <laughs> so my mother was in the military for a very long time. Got so it. we were in Northern Virginia. We were in DC for a while because she uh, worked in the Pentagon. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which cool. is always like very like, oh no. I've, I've had, I have friends who work, who work or have worked in the Pentagon. It's an interesting, interesting yes. place. Yep. Weird. Uh, yes. can have to contend with that a lot um <laughs> and so then we went to norfolk and we were sort of like in the tidewater area for a very very long time i told um, i told james before you joined that the that norfolk was the uh regional headquarters for the united states military <laughs> yes it basically is so <laughs> yeah we were in norfolk I'm not wrong. Uh, yeah we were there for a, a long time we went to memphis for a while um went back to Virginia like not we were never in the city we were always sort of in kind of like the smaller towns outside of it um and then my folks moved to North Carolina so, but so I would, oh go ahead but I went to school in Virginia like my my mother like retired from the military was like um I really want to make sure that my kids like stay in high school all four right. years That's awesome. because by that time I, I had been to like nine different schools ninth grade nine different schools and my mom was like I gift you four years with the same people. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> no, I like having enemies. <laughs> I don't know how to deal with this. Yeah. Why yeah. would you do this to me? <laughs> so, I, but it worked out really well. Uh, and I went to college in Virginia. I went to UVA. Okay. Um, so I spent a lot of time in like the mountains. Yeah. Charlottesville's <laughs> great. Charlottesville oh, yeah. was really cool. It's one of those things where I didn't really like school that much, and I don't have a lot of like great things to say about UVA. That's fine. Uh, but I really loved running away into the mountains, and <laughs> I'm just like, well, it's, I'm it's, just gonna be, I'm just gonna be in danger the whole time. Like <laughs> nobody talked to me. <laughs> yeah, the few times that I've had the opportunity to go there, I'm, I'm, I'm like you. It's like you're in the foothills, and there's the mountains in the distance, and yep. there's just so much history there. And you know, it's a very similar vibe to, 
you know, just the the foothills of North Carolina as well. It's just got that that thing. And I can and, and looking at some of the the games that you've created, I can see that being in that period, that place for as long as you were, has really inspired some of the stories uh, that you've either told to tell from a gaming perspective or from another perspective. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I feel like a really strong kinship with just like mountains in general and the Appalachian sort of vibe and the Appalachian like culture and history holds like a really I have a really special place in my heart for it mm -hmm. um you can't see it but I have a poster up here uh from the yellow finch tree sits oh yeah oh. Yep. um that I got for like supporting them nice uh, and I have like other other posters on my wall art like that's southern and but yeah the Appalachians like that area of the world uh, is very, very special to me. Well, it's it's funny because James and I um, play a game of Dungeons and Dragons with some friends that are is also on our YouTube channel, Geek in Southern, and it's that we're doing the Curse of Strahd as if it were set in Appalachia. And um, I mean, it's not as it's not as uh, honorable as you might hope, but <laughs> I can say <laughs> I can say that I you know did a lot of. Uh, research and still do in things Appalachian uh, because it's such a, an amalgamism of cultures that have come together and have created this wonderful gumbo of people and things that, uh, and, and it's still kind of preserved because even today there's still that level of isolation. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, we do try to play that into it. I mean, obviously once you kind of get into the whole Strahd story, it's kind of hard to, to do all the other pieces the way we would like, but a lot sure. of the setup and stuff, uh, was really cool. I thought anyway. That says the guy who oh, yeah. put it together. But uh, but it, but it's we're we're both very fond of that 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 part of the world. In fact, I've had I think I've probably done more miles of the Appalachian Trail in North North Carolina than any other state in my yeah. lifetime. Not all I, at once. <laughs> I'm lucky enough that like I still live like I live in the Hudson Valley. I don't live mm. in New York City. Um, sure. I could not cut it. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not built for the city. I really yeah. am not. I could not handle it. Um, but I live in the Hudson Valley, and I actually live, like, really close to the Appalachian Trail in nice. New York, yeah. which is really, I'm just, like, makes you feel good. Like, every now and then, I just go out and walk it. Um, and, and there's some great so, segments in, in New Jersey there by the Poconos, too, that are just not too far beautiful. from Beautiful. Yeah. 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 So uh, I'm really lucky that I live in an area where I can still, like, run away into the mountains. <laughs> So, and Greenville, South Carolina here, is part of the ARCs of the Appalachian Regional Committee uh, Commission map. Mm -hmm. um, I was, well, my mom's people are from Appalachia going back a couple hundred years. Uh, so they got here around the 1650s and they've been here, been there ever since. And her generation, the generation before hers, her mom and dad, are part of that out migration in the 30s. Mm -hmm. um, and so here I am back, back in that region. I was also um, a, um, acquisitions editor for University of Illinois Press, and I did Appalachian Studies and Labor History. So I was looking at your work, picked up We Will Stop the Bulldozers. Yeah. Because uh, I worked with uh, Jesse, uh, Jessica uh, Wilkerson on her book, To Live Here, You Have to Fight. It's a fantastic book. And I had also picked up this other little indie one called The Price of Coal. Oh, so, yeah. I have that. <laughs> ah, yay. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Like, so I'm okay, like, I'm okay, I'm going like, to have to have like a whole whole coal uh, week at some point so yeah yeah price of coal is really a really fun game um yes it looks grim is. but yeah it is grim it also like it's yeah i mean it's history yep. and history is often like we don't remember the brightest spots of it nope uh and i mean i know I know the history. I know the people. All of that. It's like, yeah, no, that's it's. It, they're like, it's not going to end well. <laughs> it's almost never going to end well. I'm like, yeah, no, that no, absolutely tracks. Well, yeah. and I think there was a there was a time and place in our culture where you had authors like you know Tennessee Williams and Eudora Balti that were writing around a certain type of experience, but they were writing about an experience that they were not yet going through. That is now part of that that culture that I think games and other mediums. Uh, are able to help reflect because it's you know different different mediums of expression um, because we we look at those other things as such touchstones but obviously the the areas have evolved since then so mm -hmm. so your yeah. UVA you, you don't really like school much as what I gathered you said yeah um, not my favorite <laughs> but so what was your major I was an English major 
Okay. Um, I was an English major, you know, I didn't really like, uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do after college. All I knew is I wanted to write, um, but I was an English major and I was a film studies minor. Okay. Yeah. And so you get out and you, where, where do you go to first? Do you go to like a journalist approach or just creative writing? What was your next step? After, after school, I, I went to that poetry press and oh. Yeah, so that was like a little bit of a mixture of both because it was such a small press that I, I did like a little bit of editing. Oh, yeah. A little bit of like marketing copy, a little bit of like just being an admin assistant. Uh, the official title, gosh, I think it was like I was officially like an editor, but mm -hmm. I didn't do much editing there. I did a little bit. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was just sort of keeping keeping all the wheels turning. And yep. then, and then from there, I went to the magazine where I was mostly a graphic designer, and I just sort of bullied my way into editorial. <laughs> you know, and I was just like, I, I'm here. This is an opportunity. I'm going to like do literally everything I can to get printed in this fucking magazine, <laughs> um, which worked. <laughs> and you, and so you were always leaning towards games. You, I, it sounds like uh, maybe movie reviews as well. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Totally. Uh, movie reviews, uh, book reviews. Um, mm -hmm. Books are sort of my first, my first love in a lot of ways. Um, I've written a couple books. Uh, I have, you know, stacks of them. I do book <laughs> reviews. I wish I could do more book reviews. The the the. The downside of working at io9 is that we focus a lot on visual media so mm -hmm. like a lot of like anime films television sort of thing so it's harder to fight with with so much of that expected for us to like be available and be like knowledgeable about there's just not a lot of other time to to do fiction which is mm -hmm. something that i'm like trying to change and additionally, like, you know, there's not a lot of time to do fiction. There's not a lot of time to, like, review indie titles for um, games, for tabletop games. And that's also something that I'm trying to, like, figure out how to balance and figure out how to get more of that on the site. Because I really love criticism. I yeah. really love criticism. So, and... And I, I saw that this showed up in, uh, I think you were talking to the people at Analog Game Studies at uh, one point and talking about the difference between a like a book review or movie review and a game review. And yeah, and I just, yeah. So tell, say more about that because I'm very curious. I have all kinds of ideas and I'm wondering where you want to go. Yeah, so I think that um, there's, I think that like the, the difference between a lot of reviews and critique is like pretty pretty minimal in general. Um, but I think that tabletop games and board games are specifically unique because they are impacted by your choices in a way that books aren't or right. videos aren't. There is like some of those, some videos have like scripted interactions that you can like move through, but those aren't really super common. Um, but board games and tabletop games where it's like you have so much control over how the art is expressed means that you will be you will have like different your your review and your interpretation of that media could be radically different than its intention than like someone else who like read the exact same thing you did um it's just like i feel like it makes reviewing tabletop games like a little bit more a little bit less focused and a little bit like more difficult because you sort of have to balance what you want out of a review. Do you want to review the book as written? Do you want to review the game as played? Do you want to review like the game as it's like, what what did the author intend? And should I be reviewing like an author's intentions assumedly? Or do I review like how much fun I had during a game um, when you might just have had like a poor experience that doesn't reflect how how well written the game is. So unlike something like a movie where you just sit down, you watch it and you have an experience that everyone else kind of shares, even if your interpretations are different and even if your reactions are different, games have a slightly different mechanism for 
that experience that I feel makes critiquing games just kind of like a different mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and so I've been thinking there was a one of the things that can happen with game groups, right? Where they'll get into it's like group think. Everybody knows you play mm -hmm. Wingspan since Joe's wearing the Wingspan shirt. Uh, everybody knows you play Wingspan this way. And then you go to somebody else's group and they do, they have an entirely different set of criteria and, and they're still winning the game and they're beating you. And you're like, how did we? So yeah, I, I can imagine that it's a, it is a box full of possibilities or a book full of possibilities or a, deck of possibilities and and so much depends on the rest of the people who are around you as well um, and the way that that sort of intersects with all of it well and it's interesting yeah. too because with elizabeth hargraves in particular when she put that game together she was passionate according to her she was passionate about two things spreadsheets and birds and she was able to bring a mechanic together that worked but at the same time <laughs> at the same time I've, I've seen that as the most accessible game as a gateway to bring a lot of people into the hobby better than Catan, I'm sorry, or Catan, as you can tell, I'm really bad at pronunciation on a lot of things. But uh, at the same time, when you look at the body of her work, you know, Mariposas, The Fox Experiment, Tussie Mussie and its expansions, and then this the new one that we mentioned last time that eludes me at the moment, because again, over 50. Um, you know, it's clear to me that she's got this intent about the environment and about certain things that is, she's educating and inspiring in a way, but she's also making it possible for people to have fun. And I think that that's one of the things I, and, I, and maybe that doesn't always come out in criticism, but that's one of the things I love about games is that there can be so many different layers to them. Yeah. And I think that like a good, a good critic will find those patterns and connections and make, yeah. And like be able to think about what the author intends, not just with one game, but with like all of their games, you know, like uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, James, that like you looked through the games that I've written and I'm like, I'm pretty sure that there's like, you can pick out like two or three and like group them and like have, and see kind of like the the themes of ideas that I, that I work through in my games. And I, I think that for most artists, you can do that. And I think a good critic will often tie a single work into a larger body of production of, of like right. art. And I think that that's really important when critiquing art in general. Um, I think that there's, there's like one exception, but even then it's like kind of like an exception, but like not really is like when you are writing for like a really big IP, then I'm just like, I can still look at your body of work and understand what, where you're coming from, but like Sam Raimi, like he couldn't save <laughs> Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Um, I liked that film because I liked Sam Raimi and I'm just like, ah, yes, zombies, <laughs> but like eyeballs <laughs> popping out. Like I got it. Like I, I could catch, catch the mm -hmm. Sam Raimi isms of that film but it's still like a Marvel film and it's still like not very good. So, so there's often times when people are working with big IPs where I'm just like, I think that you're probably going to do your best, but. But you've got a whole bunch of people with a whole lot of money wanting you to do very specific things. Yeah. 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 Like, I mean, I think about, that's how I sort of think about D and D that's how I sort of think about a lot of the stuff that free league puts out. Like I really admire free league. I think they do a lot of really cool original stuff. Um, I think Vason is good. I think Coriolis is good. Um, and honestly, like their IP games are also generally pretty good. Aliens good. The one ring, not the five E version, but like the one ring mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings game also pretty good. Like sets the vibe, like knows what it wants to do. But I think in general, uh, it's really hard to ignore the presence of the company. Mm -hmm. So do you think that, um, how do I even say this, sort of chokes off or down, throttles down the creativity of the, the designer, the artist? Um, does it... I mean, does it push you towards a different kind of art because you're under these different constraints? Or are you more interested in the kind of stuff that's coming out of uh, sort of more indie RPG movements 
Oh, I saw your eyes lit up. Okay, so go <laughs> so run with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I always like individual artists over artists that are working for corporations. Um, I don't that's think fair. that artists working for corporations are bad or are like selling out. Like I don't, that's not my mindset. It's just that like when you are free from constraints of like what a company wants you to do, mm-hmm. I feel like your work will be better and more expansive and like more daring and bold. Um, to uh, not to like pick on Free League, but their their Blade Runner game, right? Yeah. Um, so they they have this game that's based on uh, the Blade Runner franchise, and in it you can only play cops. Mm. And I'm like, an interesting way to talk about cyberpunk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting. So yeah, so like in that game you can only play the police force and i'm just like oh, guys oh. like who made this decision <laughs> like was it you guys um so it's just like weird oh. and then like someone like magpie games when they did like the avatar game mm-hmm. which i think is like i think it has some issues with its combat and i don't know if that was because of what like nickelodeon wanted with like more frontier rules to like have that kind of moves like in in avatar the last airbender you know and like legend of Korra, all of the fights have like these really cool moves and like this kung fu acrobatics and wing chun and like all these different styles and i don't know if they they try to develop combat mechanics to reflect that but it turns out like clunky and it works against the game which is a powered by the apocalypse game and they like really crunchified the combat rules in a way that I did not personally like. And I'm just like, who made you do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because, you know, uh, Night Models, which is a game designer out of Spain, they mm-hmm. um, do a lot of the Warner Brother properties. They've got some Harry Potter IP. They've got some uh, DC IP. And they've, they, they did recently on Game Found uh, Escape from Arkham Asylum, where you're pay- playing nothing but the villains. And Batman in this one is the big boss that they have to deal with uh, if yeah. they're, if to succeed the game. And it's, a, and it's a cooperative. So you you and your friends are all playing the villains and, and they have everybody. And if you, you know, backed all the way up on the game found, you even got some really deep Batman cuts uh, for this thing. But it, but it's, it's interesting that you say that because I, th- I think that you're, you're to your point, the, the ability to express yourself, how you want to express yourself within the medium uh, or the story or the IP is something that I think we bring from tabletop games because we, you know, we do have the ability to play so many different characters and personas. Um, but I'm curious though, do you, cause you were talking a little bit about the, the independent and the, the, the artist, do you feel yeah. like that these, these game founds and, and kickstarters are as accessible to them as they were in the beginning? Or do you feel like they're getting closed off for that particular vehicle? Uh, if that makes any sense. I think that creators have learned to adapt to the crowdfunding model. Um, And I think that tabletop creators in particular have adapted to the crowdfunding model very quickly because there aren't really traditional publishers for tabletop games. And it's really hard to, unlike something like, you know, a novel, Right. You write a novel and you're like, I want to get traditionally published. And I'm like, okay, you get like you write a query letter or you get an agent, your agent, like you revise your novel, your agent sends it out to editors. So there's a path, right? And there's not necessarily a path for tabletop role-playing games. So there's a huge like DIY aspect to tabletop role-playing games, primarily because there is not really a traditional method of publishing that would like be a part of that ecosystem, um, except for D and D, except for D and D, uh, and then we have like some some smaller publishers, Paizo, Monty Cook Games, uh, etc. But again, it's very they're very focused on their own systems and are not really like you can't really like submit like you can't like say hey I've written a tabletop game do you want to publish it? But you can't email Paizo and like say that. So there's not really like a, um, you know, a path forward. So I think that the, the cycle of crowdfunding, um, while not necessarily ideal and probably doesn't work for a lot of games, 
has been made to work within the indie sphere because it is one of the few ways that publishing a game can be made accessible to literally just like anyone, you know, if you have the time, um, if you live in the right location, because unfortunately like Kickstarter limits where they allow creators to be based out of. Right. Um, so yeah, I think it's one of those things where if you can use Kickstarter or crowdfunder or like any sort of crowdfunding platform, mm -hmm. it provides a, a, a path that is not necessarily anywhere else. Well, J James and I are friends with Christina Styles of Christina Styles Presents, and she publishes most of her stuff on RPG Drive Through. Yeah. Um, and she, you, you can find her on a few compendiums and you can find her on Amazon, but for the most part, that's where, um, her work is, is located. Yeah. Um, and then I noticed, uh, Dave Hamrick of DM Dave, um, he's basically still using Patreon and is his main vehicle. He's got his own front page now. And with all the kerfuffle with the OGL, because that's what I officially called it, the kerfuffle, um, well. <laughs> he's the he's incident. really yeah, the incident, the incident. Yes. Yes. capital T capital yes, line, the, yeah. the history repeating itself as we like to call it um, you know but watching the way he's modified his business model we were doing a, a micro mythicon last night at the friendly local game store in Pineville Carolina tabletop games not a sponsor but we talk about them all the time <laughs> um, but I was running uh, DM Dave's uh, badge quest which mm -hmm. is like you know you're Blossom Scouts and you're out selling cookies in a gothic horror neighborhood <laughs> oh, I love that. And it was great. It was a D6 system. I had these these um, three folks that were playing, and they just had a, a great time. But the, the beautiful thing about that, it was not 5e. It was not second edition uh, Pathfinder. It was a creative a game by this guy that does a lot of 5e stuff, but this was a different system. And yeah. I think he, but he's got the following on pa uh, Patreon that he can do right. that. You know, That's the... Yeah, so that's that's kind of the thing, right? That's sort of like the twist to the crowdfunding model is that it's partially a social media platform and it's partially allow it allows people to become fans of your work organically in a way that drive through RPG, even just like hosting an itch page, uh, even just like putting everything on your Patreon doesn't necessarily do for you. Um, that's where you like, uh, uh, those are, those are the places where you drive fans after they become fans of your work, but something like Kickstarter crowdfunder, which has kind of like a built in network for like driving fans to you is incredibly helpful for smaller creators. So it's one of those things where like Kickstarter is so useful for independent creators because it has this kind of, it has a built in marketing system. And it has a built-in promotional system and it sends emails on your behalf to like thousands of people that are just like, you like this game here, are like other, here are other Kickstarters you might be interested in and like, does that kind of like natural uh, marketing for you in ways that are extremely helpful to smaller independent creators who like might not necessarily have a following. So, um, obviously, I, you, I, 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 here we go. This is, this is me. I'm a, pro, I'm a, I'm a professional interviewer here. Check, check it out, you know. Um, so, I, obviously, I first discovered you uh, because of the OGL and the, the Pinkertons thing. Um, I, I have these official titles for it, as you can tell. <laughs> and um, and obviously I want to talk I want I do want to get into some of that not a lot because I know you've probably yeah. talked ad nauseum about it. I'm really curious about how you built certain relationships to learn things there without giving away anything but I'm just curious so as you're doing this and you start publishing these games like I'm it, I'm intrigued by Southern Holler that game that that game really speaks to me but I'm curious how long have you been doing that as a part of your creative outlet yeah, so I've, like I, I mentioned earlier, role-playing forums I've been doing since, like, I was a tween-ager, when I probably should not have been on the internet, uh, <laughs> and yet, that's good. I That's was. good parenting right there. <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> that was well, one of those yeah. things where it's like, I don't think my parents knew. Who knows? Yeah. They might. I don't know. We've been through the complete works of Poe. You are good yes. to go. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> 
it turned out fine yeah. so like it, whatever 15 <laughs> who cares um so uh yeah so I've I've always done that kind of writing but Southern Holler was actually like my first attempt at like really writing a game um I had done like you know kind of like supplements or whatever beforehand but it wasn't like anything serious and um southern holler was written because there was a role-playing game writing contest for trophy rpg which is the 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 system that tro- that southern holler uses mm-hmm. and i was like yeah like this looks great and i think the thing that really drew me to that besides the fact that like i enjoy creepy folklore <laughs> who among us sees something moving in the trees and then goes nope it just like keeps walking <laughs> everybody does that so it's just like perfect i could run with that like in appalachia like you heard something outside no you did it <laughs> no you did it <laughs> you didn't hear shit um so it's like perfect absolutely can run with this and the reason that i really like trophy is because it was when it was public, first published, it was published in the serialized magazine called uh, Codex, which was run by The Gauntlet and Jason Cordoba. Mm-hmm. And in this magazine, they not only published the game rules in like a incursion, which is what they call like a a setting, basically, mm-hmm. um, but they also published a guide for how to write your own incursions. Nice. Like very, very step by step. Like, here's what the theme is for this incursion. And it's like one is like mystery, one is dread, and one is like building horror. And then like the last circle of the incursion, there are five, is like doom or death or like finale or ending. So it just like laid out really, really clearly how to write for this game. And I was like, okay, like this seems really approachable. Like I have some spare time why not so i wrote southern holler and i won that contest that is so awesome so awesome yeah 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 and so after that i just sort of like kept writing and kept like practicing and uh that's but that's really how it started was just the fact that like trophy rpg trophy dark as it's called now um just had this really clear set of very approachable instructions for how to create an incursion in in that style, which was incredibly helpful and like made everything really easy and also helped with like the idea that like if you are constrained, you can sort of like think of ways to break through that constraint and be really creative within those boxes. So I really liked it and I enjoyed it. And Southern Holler is a good game. Yeah. And it looks like it was you 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 won that in 2019. Yep. So that, that was really uh, like yep. Just before the bad times. Just before <laughs> the bad yeah. times. And um did you find that the the pandemic gave you the ability to write more or were there further distractions because of what was going on in the industry as everybody discovered, "Hey, we can board game our way through a pandemic." That's what we did, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um yes and no. I definitely like during the pandemic I I wrote a lot. I wrote my novel, and then I wrote another novel. Uh, and they then were just, addictive. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then I I think I wrote games in between. But actually, like uh, right now, I've sort of decided like I really want to write a full game. Oh yeah. So I'm I'm working on a full game. So very exciting. I is, am very excited about it. Is that like thoughts. a? RPG or a table, just a board game, or is it what's is that you're doing the system from scratch? So I am writing a tabletop, a tabletop game, a tabletop role playing game, um, and I'm using the belonging outside belonging system. Okay, I don't know which, that one. Okay, yeah. okay. No, this sounds awesome, but why? Yes. Yeah, tell me more. I, I, there uh, are a lot sorry, of things I'm I don't like, know that I'm curious about, so that's okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have my little fidget, which is really just like a D20 my brother made me. (laughs) It's awesome. So Belonging Outside Belonging is a token-based game. So it does not use dice. It doesn't use cards. It literally is just like a token system. 
I've and heard about the way this. it works is that if you want to impact the narrative, you spend a token. If you allow someone else to impact you or you your character fails in some way, you get a token. And that's kind of the basis for the whole system. Um, it's collaborative. There's mm -hmm. it's it's built to be GM-less. So it's built to be like everyone kind of like using the token system as a way of like checks and balances within the game. Um, it's generally very focused on social role playing and not really very focused on combat in a lot of ways. Right. Um some belong the first belonging outside the belonging outside belonging system was established by Avery Adler and Benjamin Rosenbaum and they published two games which were Dream Apart and Dream Askew. And okay. One of them was more of a, a fan. They were both like fantasy games, but the the idea of the belonging outside belonging system is that you are an enclave, and you are a community, and you are surrounded by opposition around you. But mm -hmm. within your community, like you are, you have to work together, and you have to like establish yourself. Um, so it uses playbooks. And each playbook has different ways to like give and get tokens. And another thing that the system does that I think is really clever is that it establishes certain setting elements as characters that are basically anyone can play. So, <sighs> okay. Yeah. So they're like basic setting elements and they have moves as well. They have like token based moves sometimes. And they, and you can like spend tokens from your character to like activate parts of the setting elements. But anyone can access those setting elements at any time. Um, Very cool. Yeah, it's really, really cool. And those setting elements are stuff like the res are like resources or like the outside world or like authority, you know, and just sort of the those are the ways that that the game kind of establishes themes and how you play the game and like what problems you're going to be facing right. is sort of established through the setting elements that are all like collaboratively controlled. That's interesting. I, I, and there's Very so, cool. so many different systems now emerging uh, that are just really taking this hobby in a, in a great <laughs> direction. I, I kind of liken it to when, you know, there was a time when there were specially, you know, there were just magazines and they were very, you know, boutique magazines and there was like time, mm -hmm. life, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden the playing field in magazines got really flat. You could find a magazine for everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing is kind of happening not only in board games, but in like the tabletop role playing section where it doesn't have to relate to this one thing, 5e, because, you know, it got disrupted. But uh, I will put yeah. the I will put the Buried Without Ceremony website into the show notes, which is where you can find some more information about belonging outside belonging. Yes. Yeah. And there's some <laughs> there's some great games out there that use that system. Um, Wander Home by Possum Creek Games, which is an incredibly popular. Uh, got a stuffed system. possum back here. Yeah, that uses a that uses a modified belonging outside belonging system. Um, I really like the game Thursday by Eli Seitz. That is a basically based on Russian Doll. Oh, nice! So it uses those setting elements to like force a time loop. Interesting. It's so good. Uh, what are and Thursday, I got it. Yeah, that's yes. that's awesome. <laughs> What are some other belonging as I belong games? Dream Part, Dream Askew. Um, there's one game that I really love because I am a huge nerd and I really love Haikyuu, the anime. Okay. okay. It's a volleyball anime. It's just about like, <laughs> it's literally just about boys playing volleyball and having feelings awesome. about volleyball. And I'm like, sports are good sometimes. Um, oh. But there was this really fun belong outside belonging game about everyone like on the sports team. And it's called Volley Boys. <laughs> it's perfect. Okay. It is awesome. a perfect game. Um, but yeah, I really like Belonging Outside Belonging. I think it's it's very, it encourages the kind of role playing that I really enjoy. Um, and it allows like me to explore specific design questions. Um, mm -hmm. I can keep talking. So, and, well, and, and I have a question that kind of pushes on this a little bit that I'm interested in. Um, so when you're thinking about all of this, 
And, you know, I, I'm talking to my students. We talked about my having students uh, early on. Um, and I'm trying to convince them that games are important. What What is important or meaningful to you about games? What is pushing you to, like, be part of the gaming media as well as now, you know, writing your own game? What's What's important or meaningful to you about this weird stuff that we do? What's this? Yeah. I, yeah, we can drop an, uh, you know, uh, adults thing on this. What, what's the weird, what's great about this weird shit we do? That's right. Yeah, what's yeah. what's the special sauce? Like, yeah. what are the ingredients? What's um, important? What's meaningful here? Yeah, well, I think that games are a really incredible medium for, besides just the fact that they're fun and it encourages you to, like, talk to your friends which I'm just like, sometimes you can definitely, you can like, if you go to watch a movie together or if you go to like um, a a bar, like sometimes there, there are things where it's just like, there's not a lot of conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that games encourage conversation and encourage like thinking about the things that you're doing together um, in a way that's like very tangible and like, obvious that like this is you're doing something together and you can like see the material change on the board game or like in or you can like see the narrative change in the game that you're playing together and I think that that kind of connection is really special and really good, <laughs> I think it's good. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think that there's like you can sort of be like you can you can take that in a direction where it's like it it gives you empathy it gives you it allows you to like think critically about your actions it allows you to think critically about actions that other people are taking um and with regards to like role-playing games in particular i think that it allows you to sort of play and have fun and be creative and imaginative and i think that there are less and less fewer there are fewer and fewer outlets for that as you grow older um I think that's one of the reasons why like adult coloring books like became such a craze like a couple of years ago because everyone was like I can be creative as an adult like I can do fun RC cool things as an adult and a lot of people um box themselves in and like don't have those outlets or like they don't give themselves permission to do it right and that's kind of what I love about like tabletop role-playing games is not only do you have permission but you're encouraged to like be creative and be inventive and like there are no wrong answers etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's like it's really very good for like I think just being a human is to like be artsy and be creative and be imaginative and like remember that like you are here because like you feel things and like you should find ways to feel different things and new things and experience life in different ways and then um from like a personal perspective uh I'm queer I'm trans I'm uh yeah so role-playing games allow you space to like play with your identity in a safe way right there are very few places as an adult and even as a child where you can sort of take on and take off identities where you can sort of safely explore like oh yeah like what if my character had a relationship with someone of the same sex like what would that look like how would that feel um is that reflective of how I feel about myself in the real world? Or is this like just something that I want to try on in fiction and figure out empathetically um, or vicariously how I feel about this personally? And I think that that's incredibly good to have these sorts of containers where you are encouraged to play with your identity and you're encouraged to explore different parts of yourself through the characters that you make because yep. I think it's really great that you can sort of take bits of characters that you really like and you're just like this is my personality now <laughs> and you can sort of figure out like the kind of person that you want to be or don't want to be based mm -hmm. on like how you play characters and how you present these characters and how your characters interact with other characters and I think it's just like a great part of like a great like unintentional side effect of role-playing games that it has like this like safe safe little container where people can do that exploration well it's funny mm -hmm. you, it's funny you mentioned that because a few weeks ago we interviewed uh megan connell i was who, hoping you were going to talk about my yeah <laughs> she just published a book called tabletop role-playing therapy and on our mm -hmm. episode geek therapy uh she talks about that journey and she was saying some of the very similar things about what she discovered about herself yeah. playing role-playing games and how she began to do things with her characters 
that she would not necessarily do with in her, her, her own persona in terms of taking risks and then began to mm-hmm. realize, hmm, there's more under the hood here. And so she uses it in her, her practice. She's part of the group Geeks Like Us, and she has a Twitch channel uh, called Clinical Role, which is a bunch of clinical psychologists playing Dungeons & Dragons, which is amazing. Um, but it's also interesting because I was telling James that when we were doing this, when I was doing the, the badge quest last night, one of the part of the, the system is you roll for your personality. Mm-hmm. And so here I had um, th- three people, uh, um, a mother and a daughter, and another person who had come in. And the daughter rolled and got and became the leader. And it was because of the, the, the luck of the dice. But her flaw was she was a bully. And it was really interesting <laughs> watching her, you know, here's, she's like nine or so. She begins to lean into this. Mm-hmm. And that's what I, and one of my favorite things about role-playing uh, games is I was thinking about that episode from the Big Bang Theory when Penny's <laughs> trying to teach Sheldon about improv. Mm-hmm. And it's all about saying yes. And watching people lean in and say yes to their characters or say yes to the situation because mm-hmm. the dice is going to set up things in a way you don't expect. The story's going to set up things as you, that you don't expect. And I love it when people stop playing it safe. And will lean into their characters and lean into the story because that's what makes this so much fun. It's a collective yeah. storytelling process that has these sort of, I don't even want to call them guardrails because they're really not guardrails. They're more like an outline of where do you start the journey on the yellow road? It's structure. Yeah. I mean, you know, but this is what you do as a writer. You know. Like, This is the structure and what are you going to yeah. do inside of that yeah. and explore? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah. it's always fun for me when people take that, that leap because I've seen a lot of people that just want to play like a board game. And that's yeah. not exciting. Yeah. And I think that, I think that that's one of the reasons. So I I sort of mentioned this on, on Twitter, but I think one of the reasons that 5e has been so popular is because it doesn't have role-playing mechanics. It has combat mechanics. It has encounter mechanics. It has like some social interaction mechanics with like intimidation, performance, stuff Mm -hmm. like that. But there's nothing there that like tells you how to role-play. So in the absence of rules, people realize that they can do whatever the fuck they want, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, and that's not, that's not necessarily how like I like to play because like, if you set rules in front of me, I'm just gonna be like, okay, this is like how the game is supposed to be played. Like I want to play a game as it's intended, Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking. So but but it makes sense to me. I'm like that's like it makes sense that like five E has gotten like such a str- a, a chokehold on the industry, because the things that people really love about D and D and role playing games and even like APs like Critical Role are because of like the role playing <laughs> and like the stories and like combats like the voices and the dice yeah voices <laughs> voices are very important voices are important <laughs> um, but. Yeah, like what people remember are like the stories and the connections and mm-hmm. the the emotions that these characters are feeling. And there's like no mechanics for that. So it right. makes sense that like, oh, yeah, you can literally do whatever you want. And then like D&D also like it and D&D is not special in this way, but like D&D teaches you how to role play, right? Like it's like, OK, here's like a big bad thing. What do you want to do? And you have an option in between like bow and arrow and daggers and you sort of like even choosing which one to pick is a role-playing choice Mm -hmm. so even though it's like really small and it's not necessarily like how people consider role-playing as you like move forward in the hobby it still teaches you like okay you chose daggers why did you choose daggers over bow and arrow and if they're like oh like mechanically it makes sense and you're just like great that's like a choice that your character has made like think about that and then you can like move on so it teaches you how to engage in role-playing games simply because it does not have rules for role-playing. Well, and, I, and I, there's not pressure. And I yep. see the lay of the land where D&D has just sort of become the, the Kleenex FedEx of the hobby. <laughs> and there's so much more under that hood for people. And I look at what's happening, like the, the Shadow Dark uh, Kickstarter that is kind of bringing back some old-school mechanics and, and kind of embracing that simplicity, if you will. And then, of course, you know, uh, Mercer and those guys over at Critical Role just announced Dagger Heart a couple of weeks ago. And there's... Really suspicious. Uh, well... <laughs> I just saw that was... Yeah. 
deeply suspicious. I'm just of that. Linda. They wear their heart on their sleeve. You know <laughs> what can I tell you? But it's but it's just going to be really interesting to see because I mean you, you know obviously you've done a fantastic job building relationships within the industry, getting to know people, to learn the things at the right time in the right place, and I think that you know, the service that you have done for this hobby just by exposing the truth at the right time um, has been really interesting to to observe from a couple of points of view. Number one, as a player, mm-hmm. um, you know, we had to we had to have the conversation like, okay, look, we're, we're in the middle of this campaign. Are we just going to throw it all away and stop what we're doing? No, of course not. We're going to keep going. But at the same time, just saying, what else are we open to is part of it. But then also watching, you know, this, this I was at, James is an English guy. I was a history guy watching the history of, of Dungeons and Dragons from the days of Gary Gygax through the, the whole acquisition piece and where we are today and watching how history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but there's so much rhyming. But it rhymes, of yeah. The arrogance yeah, of that group in terms of how they look at this intellectual property and squander it at moments when they could be really making it this huge thing. And I just, I, I'm dumbfounded by that. But uh, I mean, it's, <laughs> You know, it's business as usual. It's like corporations. Yeah. I don't think they really care about the IP. They care about making money. Yes. Um, there's definitely like people who work for Wizards of the Coast and people who work for Dungeons and Dragons who like really deeply care about the product and really deeply care about the game. Um, and of course, like I find that admirable in its own way. But ultimately, D and D is controlled by Hasbro. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. It's a Hasbro product, and like the more that like. The minute that we like can sort of as a culture accept D and D in the same breath as like Barbie is like that's that's when we'll like finally be able to like fully move on. But it's it's just like we're not there yet. Well, and it's a, it's an another interesting thing too because of the so we talked about the pandemic for a minute. So here you have Magic: The Gathering. It's a billion dollar IP for Hasbro, mm-hmm. and because they can print cards is like printing money. They can keep that that cycle going in a certain way, or even though they get some flack here and there. And then you have Dungeons and Dragons, which is the hundreds of millions dollar kind of thing. If this mm-hmm. falters, this can't fix it. Right. And that's yeah. and that's a paradigm that a lot of companies find themselves at times where they have like a flagship product and another product that's growing, but it can't grow fast enough to put up for any sins. And and it becomes a whole shareholder thing because it, it was really interesting yeah. to me. I, I want to say it was about three weeks from the time that your article dropped on, I think it was Gizmodo is where I first saw it. That doesn't mean that's where it yeah. was. Things get replicated, as you know. And right. I was watching, because um, we had bought some Hasbro stock around Christmas time, just not a lot, just enough to kind of track. And I didn't think much about it. And then all of a sudden I was watching, how long did it take CNBC to pick up on what you had picked up on? And I want to say it was like three weeks. And yeah. when that happened, that was around the time, oh, well, we're going to do this now. And because the shareholders all of a sudden realized, what are you guys doing? I think, I hope yes. I'm, I'm, you know, and, and shareholders can include organizations like, BlackRock and Fidelity, these institutional investors that look at certain properties. And, you know, BlackRock is one that actually looks out there and says, okay, no, let's not just invest in companies. Let's invest in companies that, that are doing good in a, in a certain paradigm, if you will. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that those kinds of influences, it's unusual and because it only affects Hasbro because everybody else has got a very different way of working and they don't have that. I, I can't think of any other public companies that are doing board games uh, at that level. Uh, there might there, be one. I just there, don't know it. There isn't any. Yeah. <laughs> there aren't any. Um, that's kind of like the great the great irony of all of this is like D and D, like D and D alone, not not Wizards of the Coast, just D and D made hundred and fifty million dollars in twenty twenty two. Nice. Yeah. Hundred and fifty million. Paizo, fifteen million. Order of magnitude, yeah. Yeah, and like uh, Monty Cook Games, I think ten or twelve million, and like these are these are kind of estimates, right? Mm-hmm. Because like we don't have the full picture, but even estimating the fact that like D and D controls a hundred percent more of the market, just just based on like what they do, and of course that again, sort of going back to magnitude and scale, that means that there are that many more people creating for D and D and creating for five E and it's just overwhelming. It's just like, it's a monopoly in a very, very clear and obvious way. And when you are 
Like they just launched a, a television channel. <laughs> you know, because you can. Why not? Because they, like they're just like, well, we have money to burn. Like let's let's fuck it up. Um, <laughs> just when everybody else is getting out of streaming. I know. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's it's like Where's they. That? Their power and influence and the money that, like, D&D Wizards of the Coast hold is just, like, incomparable to any other tabletop role-playing game product mm. or company at all, ever. I mean, not ever. Uh, there was, like, a time where it was, like, it was like just, like, one of many. Right. Um, but definitely, like, right now, in incomparable. Like, it... it Anything like you cannot talk about tabletop role playing without talking about D and D, and I think that's like to the detriment of games in general. So, since you've been involved with the the big the two big news stories of twenty twenty three in the gaming industry, as far as I'm concerned, how has that changed your life? Uh, it you gets to talk to two weirdos from the Carolinas. Though. Well, that yeah, <laughs> but. To be fair, yeah. that could have happened even if that other thing hadn't happened, you know. So, I mean, we, we would have eventually um, invited them yeah. onto our show. Yeah, I mean, like, day-to-day -day hasn't, not much has really changed. I'm definitely, like, a little bit busier and um, a little bit more aware of what D and, of what, like, Wizards of the Coast is doing. Because until the OGL, like, I reported on it and I, like, did a little bit with it. But it's, like, I don't care about D&D. &D. <laughs> I don't care about Wizards of the Coast. I like small indie games. I like mm. small indie outfits. Um, I have like so many games just like within arm's reach. <laughs> and it's just like D D is just like not something I'm interested in. I simply do not care. Sure. Uh so unfortunately now I have to care a little bit more about D. &D. Um <laughs> which is well, like the, the it's biggest all, change. In your in your Wikipedia bio, it's always gonna be associated with you. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And that's that's really cool. Like I'm really grateful that this I is your was... Woodward and Bernstein moment. It was. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, and I'm totally fine with that. Uh I'm happy that I was able to do it. I'm happy that like I that my editor saw it happening. And when I got like the first leak and I told them like I'm gonna have to like follow the story for the next month, my editor at the time, my editor in chief had like knew about D, D, like was a D, D person, is a nerd, and he understood the implications of like what I had gotten. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, because so my editor is James Whitbrook and he's just a big nerd. He's a 40k player. That's like his whole vibe. Oh yeah. Yep. Uh and then my editor in chief at the time was David Ewalt, who actually has like written a book on D, &D called of of dice and of men. dice and men yeah, yeah i've got I've it it's on book. the shelf in the other room yep. yeah yeah so he was my editor-in-chief and so so when i told him i'm just like i have something really big <laughs> and i explained it to him he's like yes chase it <laughs> do whatever you need like uh, awesome. i'll take you off like other things like go for it um so i was really lucky that uh, i had both david and james kind of like solidly in my corner being like doing that that's awesome yeah yeah so that was really incredibly helpful but uh yeah uh at work i think is it's the biggest change because now i have a lot of trust within not only like the the role-playing game community um with my reporting on D, D, but also like my reporting on wormwood and i have other stories kind of in the works because mm. of how i've handled those stories right oh very cool yeah and that's really cool and exciting and that's like the probably the biggest change is just like i i have i've like always have at least one or two investigations going at any given time awesome which is great because that's what i really love <laughs> um and you're suddenly on what we used to call a rolodex on other people they're like yeah hey, you know who we should talk to we should talk to linda yeah that's true and that's really cool yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, and I think um, the fact that you've got the the persistence, you've built the relationship, you've got the passion for it, and now you've got the street cred, you know that 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 puts you at a level of <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, it puts you at a yeah, level no, of right. being able to to drive that and be that voice for the you know for everybody. I mean, it's not just the the indie gamers; it's for everybody because these these things impact the, the player. You know, we mm -hmm. have we have wallets too, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and if the if the foundation changes, I mean the, the thing I love about some of these games is that as the DM I incur most of the costs. 
mm-hmm. or they the the DM would incur most of the cost, and everybody else can just show up with a piece of paper and a pencil, yeah, or an iPad, or I guess that's costly. But, Whatever works, you know. But the, yeah. but the idea is, and that's that's the thing is, is keeping it open in that way was just was just huge from my perspective, and, oh, and uh, making making informed decisions, and your work allows us to do that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm glad that it found the audience it did. And I'm grateful I was able to pursue these stories with single mindedness <laughs> and kind of like a really bullheaded level of determination. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And um, yeah, kind of a, a fearlessness that a lot of other newspaper outlets don't necessarily get to have. Because I have had sources say like other other outlets won't run this because um, they don't want to make wizards mad, and I'm just like, it's okay. I'll do it. <laughs> well, it's and it's it's, it's interesting. Fine. It's interesting because a few weeks ago we talked to uh, Professor Dungeon Master from Dungeon Craft, and and it was mm-hmm. during the OGL piece, um, and we were talking about the number of YouTubers that that took your story and latched onto it and reported on it, and there were some that I think we're being patient to kind of see what this really was versus the people yeah. that were piling on trying to get yep. uh, likes and subscribers and, and use that mm-hmm. as clickbait to improve their channel versus the ones that really were playing it yeah. down the middle and being authentic to the community. And, um, you know, and, and we're seeing the same thing play out in other, uh, with the magic uh, and the Pinkertons thing, because I see the exact same thing across yeah. my YouTube feed. Uh, yeah. of how people are talking about these things. And it's important that we just kind of keep the conversation in the community. Totally. I think that the OGL allowed for a lot more, a lot more like areas of discussion because it was, it's like, a, it was like a pretty intense legal document and it was a, mm-hmm. there was a lot to take apart and a lot to think about and like a lot of vectors for that. Um, I think that that's, not necessarily the case with the Pinkerton story, um, simply because no no matter what, Wizards of the Coast sent, like, has a relationship with the Pinkertons, has <laughs> hired Pinkerton agents to be, like, high-level executives at their company, wow. and has repeatedly, like, you know, regularly sent Pinkerton agents to, to find Magic the Gathering cards. Um, And I think that there is like a kind of moral imperative here that you sort of have to decide for yourself. And of course, this is the the way it is with journalism. You have to read something and decide for yourself how you want to feel about it. But I think that with, with the Pinkerton issue, you sort of have to decide for yourself whether or not you are comfortable supporting a company that hires an, uh, like an, a more or less a paramilitary force to mm-hmm. come to people's homes and get product. And I think that like there's, or like, you know, a, pa- a para police force. And I think mm-hmm. there's like a moment where you just sort of have to think about like, should these organizations even exist? Should should Pinkerton agents be allowed to like knock on your door and get information? Should private detectives have that kind of relationship to the law and relationship to corporations? and relationship to like being paid to do police work Mm -hmm. in our last oh sorry go ahead yeah yeah so i just yeah so i think that like with the the pinkerton issue and like wizards of the coast there's a lot less for me personally to debate about because i personally find uh that mode of uh like yeah, I, I personally find that mode of like m- military, like policing, mm-hmm. really reprehensible. Well, yes. in our last episode, I referred yes. to them as the as America's version of the Wagner Group, because at one time, uh, Pinkertons was bigger than the United States Army, yep. and I find it very interesting now that I've learned a little bit more about you and and your writing that the villain in some of the stories that you would be telling about certain union stories in the South have the same callback to the same villain that we're talking about here with the magic of the gathering, gathering and the Pinkertons. What? Cause That's they crazy. were everywhere. <laughs> 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 what? No way. Uh, 
Yeah. So <laughs> I, I was really, really, I, I tried to be like as careful and as like, um, removed from that reporting as possible because I know that I have like an extreme bias against that agency in particular and like mm -hmm. any kind of, um, again, extra police secure, like private mm -hmm. security force. Um, that's not like we're hiring you to follow this person around and like protect them because like they need protection, you know, like by bodyguards. I'm like, bodyguards are fine. <laughs> <laughs> bodyguards are fine. Um, but so I just knew that I had like this extreme bias and I'm like, I need to be like really careful and really judicious about like how and when I offer my opinion if I do at all mm -hmm. and be like, here yeah. are the reported facts and that's it. So, well, actually, I think that's one yeah. of the things I've really appreciated about reading your work is that you do find the ability to be objective down the middle. There's so many news organizations that will inject their opinion or in the, the gaming space will do so because there might be some advertising going on that they're trying to hawk some products. And I think the fact that, you know, you've been able to keep your objectivity in, in the storytelling is, is a key part of being a good investigative journalist. Yeah, so. for my investigations, absolutely. Like for for anything where I like talk to someone else, I try to be as objective as possible. But I also like, you know, any if, like you if you write anything, you will have a bias. Every journalist has a bias. Uh, there, I don't think that there's anything there is like not even. I don't think it's even possible for me to be an objective journalist because mm -hmm. I'm writing. <laughs> it's me. I'm writing. And literally that's the same for like literally anyone who writes anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely like try very hard to understand where those biases are and like figure out if they're helpful to the story or if they're harmful to the story. Mm -hmm. um, and for something like the Pinkerton thing and for something like the OGL, I'm just like, my biases are both helpful and harmful. And I need to figure out which ones like actually serve the story and which ones like people actually like need to know about uh so yeah i think that like i try to i think that like when it comes to objectivity i try to figure out how how to be objective while also still recognizing that like there's no way for me to be objective and there's no way for <laughs> anyone to be objective yeah. it's just sort of figuring out like the balance and figuring out like where it's helpful and where it's harmful mm-hmm so we've been chatting for like an hour yeah. at this point, and <laughs> oh. we had sort of talked about maybe an hour or so, just trying to be respectful of your time. Um, this is a fantastic conversation, uh, but I was just thinking we should probably, it's, I have, you know, uh, Mother's Day events to yes. take care of too, yes. so... Um, oh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, well, we can we can. Sounds always... like your yeah. Help, say hey to your mom for us. And <laughs> yeah. I will. Hope she's watching more Star Wars. But yeah, there you My... go. That's the perfect Mother's Day. <laughs> she, Here, it's a lightsaber. She loves Yoda. <sighs> a lot. Okay. Yoda's yeah. her favorite. Um, and then Princess Leia is also like second favorite. But it's yeah. a toss up in between Yoda and Princess Leia. She also really liked Baby Yoda. I got oh, her, yeah. like a I got her like a little Grogu pendant nice for, for christmas a couple years ago um yeah but it's not until i have like an hour and a half left before the family zoom so yeah <laughs> ah. uh, i'm happy happy to go into the next segment Jay, of, well we can we can certainly well first do uh, absolutely thank you for the opportunity to get to know you better and, and learn more about you and and what yes. you're doing i think that's fantastic at some point i'm going to ask you offline about what you think about firefly by adobe since you're involved in the visual arts that's the new AI thing, but we won't get into that because we don't talk sure. AI here. We are a board gaming podcast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, can, I can sort of tell you really quickly. I hate it, uh, but, we can, but we can talk about that more later. Yeah, sure. yeah. Okay. I work with a lot of graphic designers, so I can I understand. Um, <laughs> so I hate it. <laughs> so I think what uh, I did have a news story in here, James. I'm going to go ahead and just go past that one because I don't think it's as interesting as what is on our table. Um, I I'm going to. I have two things on my table and I can just jump right into it because it's really it, man. simple. Uh, Darwin's journey is on our table. Uh, that Kickstarter came in and it took me a week after of unboxing to figure out how to play it. And uh, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a learning curve, which, you know, these guys at Thundergriff games, they put out some great games. They did Tang Garden, which is one of our favorites. 
Um, and now that we've kind of cracked the code on Darwin's journey, it is one that I think we're going to be playing a lot of. Big shout out to the YouTube channel Game Court. They have uh, maybe 260 followers. Hopefully they'll get a lot more because they're doing a really nice job. They were the only video I could find that was the post Kickstarter delivery of how to play this game. And it really helped shorten the learning curve. So I was really grateful to those guys. And um, of course, I already talked about Badge Quest, did that last night at the game store uh, with some folks. And so it was fun to get out and play those games and uh, just kind of teach some people the love of the hobby. And that was great. So that's that's what I got. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, let's see. We've the semester has ended for Laura and I, so we've gotten a whole bunch of stuff to the table. But I think we could probably, I mean, the the one these are all old favorites except for Furnace, uh, which was a fun, mostly card driven kind of game. And Laura, about halfway through the rules teacher, was like, "Oh, I think I've got this," and she did. She went ahead and and beat me at it, so that was good. <laughs> Super fun little a uh, little game. Um, yeah, I think we can just keep moving super quick. Uh, Linda, what's have, what's been on your table? What's on my table? Well, I'm currently playing a, a campaign of Orbital Blues, which is like sad space cowboys um, in kind of like a retro future. So think like That's Firefly, cool. Cowboy Bebop, mm -hmm. Chronicles yeah. of Riddick, kind of that vibe. That sounds cool. Um, I also have some books on my table. This is Yay. Mave Fly by C.J. Lead. Okay. Which will be out soon. I also have d d d d uh, Camp Damascus by Chuck Tingle, who you may okay. know for, yes. for, for from his erotica. Yes. Um, this is a, an incredibly good. It's a great. Career. It's a great name for someone writing an erotica. That's <laughs> yes. what I always. Um, yeah. So this is a uh, queer horror novel, and it's coming out in July. So it's coming out pretty soon. Um, and it's really, really wonderful. It's ARCs for the win. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Uh, I have actually Thursday, which is the belonging outside ah, the game. Yeah. But it's beautiful. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this is a podcast, so you can't see it, but it's got this like art deco, black and white interior style. Oh, that's lovely. It's just really wonderful. Nice um, font too. Yeah. yeah. And then like, here's a playbook, which is again, like an illustration of a man in this very blocky style that I really love. Yeah, um, that's very cool. It's almost woodblocky. Yeah. I also have Crescendo of Violence, which is a cyber neon noir role playing in that looks really Utah, interesting. New York. I really love this. It's got like a D10 system um, and it ha it, it's very focused on its themes of corruption and city life and classism and the, like a future future nostalgia vibe. Mm -hmm. where it's like I'm, so, I'm sensing themes throughout your interests yeah. <laughs> yeah so not really corporations in charge anymore but like mob bosses and families are in charge uh, okay just like the old um, days just like the yeah. yes again like a future like nostalgia <laughs> yeah yeah i also have women are werewolves which is a card-based role-playing game by ninth ah. level games and in this game all women turn into werewolves but you're non-binary <laughs> <laughs> ah. so it's really it's really an incredible game about like where do you fit in with your community how do you mm -hmm. reject norms how do you embrace norms like if you were like assigned male at birth like would you want to become a werewolf to sort of show that you're in between um if you were assigned a female at birth like would you want to deny that part of yourself or would you want to like embrace it regardless? So it's this really mm -hmm. interesting exploration of identity. Uh, it's really good. Great questions. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I also have the ultimate RPG tarot deck. Ah, nice. <laughs> That's hilarious. Love that. Yeah. They, they just sent it to me. It's, it's a really... very Rider weight look to the box. Yes. And it's definitely like a Rider weight inspired. Um, I like it, but it's very D and D focused. It, okay, I thought because, I saw a D twenty on the on the box there. So yeah. you did, and I have a bunch. I have like literally three other tarot decks here because I was playing a tarot based game. Oh, cool. Um, I'll show you two more things, then I'll let you let us move on. First is my dumpster fire. My <laughs> I love that dumpster fire. <laughs> That's fantastic. Which I really love. Um, and then lastly, I'll show you this D twenty that my brother made for me. 
Ooh, that's oh, very cool. cool. Yeah, and you can sort of see that there's like a little uh, paper boat in there. A yeah, little paper boat. That's yeah, amazing. That is neat. So he he made this for me. Move it a little and bit to of... your right. Oh, there we go. Up oh, there, right there. Stop, stop, stop. Yeah, because we do we do actually put the video on uh, YouTube so that people will see that. So I want to make sure that they saw that. Yeah, that's very that's cool. very cool. So yeah, I have that on my desk. Oh, the other thing on my have... desk is this cat. Hello, cat. <gasps> Kitty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I also have a little plate doctor. Awesome. Oh, that's super adorable. Oh, that's yeah. great. I you know, am... you're living in a particular part of the of your life when you're like, oh yeah, plague doctor. That's super cute. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have like a do I have like a plague doctor like tattooed on my on my thigh. Like, cool. I love them. Um. Anyway, so that's the stuff on my desk. Awesome. Uh, a, a selection. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I actually I actually backed the game Pest. Where that, that has a plague doctor in it. It's a, it's a Kickstarter. It'll be out hopefully soon. Hopefully, I've I've learned to be patient with Kickstarter. Oh yeah, and <laughs> yes. deliveries. It's, you just gotta buy it and forget about it. And then when it comes to you, it's like a cute little gift. Yeah, like, but uh, <laughs> I I finally I finally just had to tell my wife that uh, there would going to be a series of delivery deliveries, and I really didn't know what they were. Yeah. So we just box them up and wait till a, a necessary holiday like Mother's Day. Um, hey, there hey, there you go. Um, so we move on to speaking of Kickstarter. What are we? What have we backed, or what are we intrigued by, James? Because of the last conversation we had, I did back the paperback typewriter um, reprint, tenth uh, anniversary edition. I guess it is. Yep. Yep. Um, the Tim Fowers. Yep. But this is my my wife is somebody. She's in. She's got her master's in English. Uh, loves these kinds of word games, and so this was right in her aesthetic. So I was like, "Yep, this is perfect. Got to get that." Uh, and then I also backed uh, Botany, the adventure, uh, a game full of adventure, intrigue, and flowers. So, uh, awesome. but it was enough to say, "Okay, that's uh, that's backable from my standpoint." So very cool. Kind of light for me on the Kickstarter side, which is probably healthy. <laughs> But I did see what you were intrigued by, and I was intrigued by that too. So I'll let you you uh, talk yeah, about it. Yeah, well, we're gonna you know go back to the India for a little bit. So Nations and Cannons, the American Civil or sorry Revolutionary War, and I'm just sort of astonished by the work that these people must have done, and they have names. Um, Flag Bearer Games uh, are the the lovely company that's doing this um, out of Jersey City, New Jersey, apparently, and um, but it is sort of recasting a lot of D, D stuff just to play a revolutionary american era tech and moments and you're a spy and doing other things uh and sort of switching magic to understand it as you know, like throwing a lot of charisma into a battle kind of stuff although and my favorite part is that they still allow you to play all of the weird fun magical stuff if you want to so i just the idea just sort of tickled me and the idea they have got, got some one little extra thing that lets um oh let's see here it is da, 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 da. speaking of virginia um we've got oh what is his name where'd you go come back here i'm just going to keep saying strange things while uh i scroll down trying to find you can get all kinds of good stuff star spangled mm -hmm. dice which is hilarious um and i'm going to lose control of, oh, there it is ha ben franklin the banshee slayer so well, there you go lincoln was well, a vampire I'm, hunter so you yeah know, we've we've got a little an animation of him with his key and his eyes glowing so that'll be but uh ben franklin banshee slayer i thought was kind of hilarious i will probably not be backing this but it just seemed a fascinating bit of work to just try to reimagine all of this other rule set and apply it to this entirely different i mean yeah it setting is, historical it, place it has been showing up in my social feeds and i have been ignoring it okay so well, let's see we'll, we'll decide between now and next time if i am successful in ignoring it or if it in, it sucks me in like everything yeah. else tends to do when you recommend it and at the end at the end of the semester allows me a little free time to just like ooh, what's that and uh Bought a little bright bits here and here and there. So, yeah. That's awesome. Um, well, Linda, thank you so much for being a thank part you. of Lay It on the Table. If uh, you are interested in knowing more about Linda, 
You can find them at lindacodega.com, and I will put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, check out their work. Uh, check out their articles and watch that career with keen interest because I think we're going to see a lot more about the gaming industry from this young person. Uh, yes. As yeah. usual, you can follow us at layitonthetable.show. You can go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a nice review, a snarky review. Uh, you can make fun of all the things that I mispronounce and uh, all the things that I do wrong. Uh, you can find us at Board Game Geek, where we have both a guild and a link to our podcast. And of course, as always, you can find us at Geek and Southern on the YouTube channel. Uh, I guess that's how we would say it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> as usual, I'm Joe Mahaffey. I am not bored. I am bored gaming. And I'm James Engelhart, hoping that all your tiebreakers break your way. I'm Lena Cadega. I'm a nerd. <laughs> One of us. See you next time, everybody. One, two, three, Bye, four.